Well, amen. If you have your Bibles, you're going to be turning to Daniel chapter 6. Daniel chapter 6. After a couple of weeks of focusing on the crucifixion, as well as the resurrection and the resurrected Christ, we're back in our study of the book of Daniel. The miraculous and the mysterious. Certainly as we have journeyed through this book, it is easy to see that the miraculous takes place. Whether it is the three Hebrew children who are saved from the fiery furnace to the handwriting on the wall to the story that we have today, which is probably one of the best known stories regarding the events leading to Daniel being thrown into the lion's den and God preserving him, we certainly are able to see that in the book of Daniel there are all kinds of miraculous events. Then after chapter 6, one of the chapters that we've already looked at, but after chapter 6 begins to focus on the mysterious. For this is the last of the historical chapters that's actually in the book of Daniel. Talking about the events of Daniel are his friends. And then beginning in chapter 7, it begins to talk about the various visions that have been given to Daniel. And it actually goes back to reference those. Some of those happened during the reign of Belshazzar. Some of them happened during the reign of Darius. And it's going to help you know when those visions were given. But he takes those prophecies and visions and puts those all together in chapter 7 through chapter 12. So this is the last of the historical chapters. We saw the last time we were together in the book of Daniel that Belshazzar, who had defiled man and defiled God, and who had said that he thought he was greater than God to the point that he brings out the gold and the utensils of the temple and drinks out of those and mocks God, well, God shows up, remember, with a handwriting on the wall and says that you've been weighed, you've been measured, and you've been found lacking. And Belshazzar dies that night, and the kingdom of Babylon it ends that night, and Darius the Mede becomes king, it says, of the age of 62. So now Darius, who's the Medo-Persian king, begins to rule and reign, and what's going to happen with Daniel? Well, Daniel, because he's a spirit-filled man, always seems to distinguish himself. He seems to be picked up and he seems to be placed in that position of leadership. I believe that whenever we are spirit-filled, I believe we have the best opportunity of distinguishing ourselves in the life in which we live. No matter what that occupation might be, no matter when that history might be that we're placed in, when we are spirit-filled, we have an opportunity of distinguishing ourselves in the midst of the world for the very same reason that Daniel did, and that is because an extraordinary spirit indwelt this man. And we have an extraordinary spirit. I think that's an understatement, for we have the Spirit of God in our hearts. And the Spirit of God helps us to be better than we are, better than we ever hope to be in the flesh. The Spirit of God actually helps us to reclaim the glory of God and allows us to become what God intended us to be. And so I hope today that you're challenged in your heart that you will be spirit-filled just as Daniel was, that you'll begin to practice some of the things that Daniel practiced in his life, and that God might use you in the place where you are right now in your life in distinguishing you in the world, not for your glory, but for the glory of God. That there'd be the fact that it'd be said of you that there's something different about you, not because it brings you accolades, but because you're able to say it's only because I have a relationship with the living God. Listen to what it says in Daniel chapter 1, I mean Daniel, Daniel chapter 6, verse 1 and following. It seemed good to Darius to appoint 120 satraps over the kingdom, that they should be in charge of the whole kingdom. And over them three commissioners, of whom Daniel was one, that these satraps might be accountable to them, and that the king might not suffer loss. Then this Daniel began, underlying this, distinguishing himself among the commissioners and satraps, because why? He possessed an extraordinary spirit. And the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. Then the commissioners and the satraps began trying to find a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs. Now underline this. But they could find no ground of accusation 
are evidence of corruption inasmuch as he was faithful and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. What a resume. <laughs> what a testimony about a man. Look what happens in verse 5. Then these men said, we shall, find, we shall not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel, underline this a minute, unless we find it against him with regard to the law of his God. Now, this is what basically says. This guy lives such an exemplary life. This guy is so honest. This guy has so much integrity. We're not ever going to be able to find anything to accuse him. We're not going to ever be able to find any fault in him regarding his governmental affairs. The only thing that we might be able to trap him in is that he is loyal to his God. He is faithful to his God. He serves and is obedient to the law of his God. And if we can find some way to entrap him because of his service and love and loyalty to God, then we could get him. It's going to have to be in relationship to his God because we can't find anything wrong with this guy's life. Now, how many of you would like to have that said about you? Man, I would. The rest of you, I feel sorry for you. I don't know what you want in your life. I mean, I'm here to tell you. That's the testimony you'd want about your life. Can't find anything wrong with that guy. Can't find anything wrong with that lady. Can't find anything wrong with the only place we might find is, is they love their God so much. They are so faithful to their Lord and they're going to be so faithful in doing what he says. Maybe we can find something there. Look what happens. Then these commissioners and satraps, verse 6, came by agreement to the king and spoke to him as follows. King Darius, live forever. Now Darius ought to know when they said that he, they were, he was in trouble right there, didn't he? King, live forever. Listen to verse 7. All, you need to circle that word, all the commissioners of the kingdom, the prefects, the satraps, the high officials, and the governors have consulted together that the king should establish a statute and enforce an injunction. Here it is, that anyone who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days, just 30 days, for 30 days shall be cast into the lion's den. Shall be cast into the lion's den. Now look at verse 8. Now, O king, establish the injunction and sign the document so that it may not be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians. Have you ever heard about the law of the Medes and Persians? That's a statement that's made even in our daytime. Boy, that's like the law of the Medes and Persians. It cannot be changed. It cannot be changed which may not be revoked. Verse 9. Therefore, King Darius signed the document that is the injunction. You ought to put a star by that in your Bible, verse 9, and say he's going to regret that. You need to put that star right there and put it in your mind. And, and, and remember this. Be careful when you're making commitments. Be careful when you're signing something. Be careful when you're making an agreement. You better make sure you see the end result of that. You better make sure you find out the motivation behind that. But King Darius didn't. He did. Well, that sounded like a pretty good idea. You know what happened to him? The same thing that happens to many people right before they fall and falter. And that is the fact his pride got a hold of him. His pride got a hold of him. He said, well, that sounds pretty good. I'd tell you just for 30 days. Don't you think nobody should pray to anybody but me? Not their gods, not any other man. But for 30 days, I think they ought to focus on me and show their loyalty to me. His pride got a hold of him. Look at verse, nine, uh, verse 10. Now, when Daniel knew that the document was signed, he entered his house. Now, in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem. And he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God, as he had been doing previously. Then these men came by agreement and found Daniel making petition and supplication before his God. Then they approached and spoke before the king about the king's injunction. 
Did you not sign an injunction that any man who makes a petition to any god or man besides you, O king, for 30 days is to be cast into the lion's den? The king answered and said, The statement is true according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which may not be revoked. Then they answered and spoke before the king, Daniel, who is one of the exiles from Judah, pays no attention to you, O king, or to the injunction which you signed, but keeps making his petition three times a day. Then as soon as the king heard this statement, listen to what it says, he was deeply distressed. He was deeply distressed and set his mind on delivering Daniel. And even until sunset, he kept exerting himself to rescue him. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said to him, said to the king, recognize, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or statute which the king establishes may be changed. Then we'll finish at verse 16. Then the king gave orders and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. And the king spoke to Daniel, your God whom you constantly serve will himself deliver you. We will get to that part next week. There's some truths that we need to understand. First of all, we need to see that this man who is filled with the Spirit of God distinguishes himself. And it ought to challenge us. If we're sitting here and all we do is walk out of here with historical knowledge about what happened to Daniel, we've missed the boat. Because what God wants to do in our heart is He wants to put a challenge before us to be such men. Daniel was one, it seemed as though what it says, the cream always rises to the top. Well, Daniel was the cream, obviously, because he always rose to the top. In Nebuchadnezzar's leadership, he became a leader. He became one who had great power, second in command, basically, to Nebuchadnezzar. And he stayed in that position at all of those times, had all kinds of influence. Even when Belshazzar begins to rule, he doesn't seem to have much position there. But when it comes time to who's going to have to interpret what the handwriting on the wall says, it's going to be Daniel who's distinguished because the Spirit of God is in him. And Darius, when Darius came into leadership, he felt like that the the government needed to be organized. So he put 120 satraps over that government and over the country, the nation, and three commissioners then who were over those. And one of those three commissioners was Daniel. Daniel, a Jew. Daniel, an exile from Judah. Daniel, who was not nationally born. Daniel, who had no place except for the fact there was something unique about him. He was good at what he did. He was good at what he did, and he was able to distinguish himself as a leader among men. And Darius was smart enough that if you're going to be successful, get the best you got and put them in charge. And so he takes him, and he puts him, and makes him one of those three commissioners. But that's not all. Listen, God didn't want him to be one of three. God wanted to be one. So what happens? In that position as a commissioner, he begins to distinguish himself. He's smarter. He's always been smarter than others. He's smarter. He's wiser. He makes the best choices. He's loyal. He's dedicated even to that old pagan king. He's loyal and dedicated to them because he's doing what God would have him to do because he has a spirit of God in him. When it says the extraordinary spirit, the better way to write that, I said it's an understatement. You ought to underline or mark out extraordinary and just say spirit of God. Because see, extraordinary just doesn't really quite do it for me because the spirit of a holy God is far beyond extraordinary. You understand that? And the spirit of God was in him and made him unique to the point, what did it say? That the king's plan was to elevate him and to put him as being the number one person in charge of the whole nation. Now, I want you to understand something. Now, hold on here. Everybody who's gray-headed, and I know I am too, but I want you to listen for just a minute. Y'all listening? You're saying, boy, I tell you what, old Daniel, he was good in his prime. Hold on just a second. Do you know how old Daniel was? Daniel was probably in his 80s, probably in his 90s, whenever he's taken on this leadership. Because he got over there in exile, and then all of a sudden he's going to be over there. You've gone through Nebuchadnezzar's reign and all of those other kings who reigned. He's been in there at least 70 years. 
And however old he was, whenever he, he went there, so he was in his 80s, probably even could be as much as his 90s, but he's distinguishing himself at that place. Now, why would I say that to you? Do not think that your best days are over. Do not say that, think that your best days are over. God can use you. God can distinguish himself in you. God can make you uniquely gifted for what your responsibilities are. You have to let the Spirit of God use you. Daniel was not in a retirement plan. I do not know if Babylonians had Social Security, but he wasn't living off of it. He hadn't quit. And we cannot quit. We've got something to do. We've got a work to fulfill. And still things that distinguish us in our lives. Oh, you may not have the physical stamina that you used to. You still have a mind that you can use. You still have something that can make you unique and, and gifted and God can use you to, to get his own glory. And because this man was so filled with his spirit, he had qualities in his life that everybody needs and, and what God wants. Listen to what it says about this man. It says that they could find, verse 4, they could find no ground of accusation or any evidence of corruption. He's been in government for all of those years. Don't you know he had opportunity to be corrupt? Don't you know he had opportunity to take something that wasn't his? Don't you know he had, had opportunities to lie, to make missteps? Don't you know he made enemies along the way? Don't you know that there could be anybody else could be found something about it? But in regard to him, when they're trying to find something, they can't find anything that's wrong with this man. I'm here to tell you, friends, let me tell you something. The only person that you find out about that that, he, that is in a similar situation was who? It was Jesus. You remember when Jesus, they were making accusations, they couldn't find anybody. They had to pay somebody to make accusations against Jesus. Now, was Daniel Jesus? No. Was Daniel perfect? No. But I'm here to tell you, it's good when you get pretty close. It's good when you get pretty close. Don't you know they had searched out? But they found that he had given no evidence of corruption. There was no grounds for any accusation. Listen to what he was described. He was faithful. He was a faithful man. Not only that, he did not neglect his duty. He fulfilled what he was supposed to do. And neither was there corruption to be found in this man. And that's how he distinguished himself. And Darius was smart enough to say, that's the guy I want in charge. That's the guy that I want in charge. That's what people ought to say about us. People ought to say that about us. I want that person in charge. I want that person leading. I want that person around me. Why? Because they have a spirit in them that is of God. And they're honest and they're truthful and they're faithful. What wonderful qualities. And they're found in the life and the man named Daniel. Now understand this. That any time you begin to distinguish yourself and you begin to stand out because of those qualities God's placed in your heart and you're seeking to live for Him, there's going to be some people that don't like it. And there were people who didn't like it. And therefore, they wanted to set a trap and they wanted to, to have a, a, a deceit of the king and some way to get rid of this guy, Daniel. Some way to undercut Daniel so he's not in charge. <laughs> and the neat thing about that, it, it says it, that as they're looking at it, verse 5, these men said, we shall not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel. We can't find anything, we can't find anything against it. They're wanting to. They're wanting to find something, but they can't find it in regard to his work. And this is where they said, the only place we might be able to trap him is in relationship to his God. He's in relationship to his God. He loves his God so much that if we can find that he's doing something that we can establish that would be contrary to the king and make the king have to take judgment, then we will have him. Now, I don't know about you. I would hope that my life would be such that when somebody was wanting to trap me, they'd say, well, the only place we could trap him is in relationship to his love and loyalty to God. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't that be marvelous? 
And that's what they said. And they studied him for a while. It doesn't say that, but you know they studied him a while. And you know what they found out about him and his relationship to his God? You need to hang on this. Don't go to sleep yet. After I do this, you can go to sleep. Somebody will punch you at the end. Okay? But do not go to sleep on this. You need to hear this, all right? They began to study him so that they could find out how could we trap him. How can we trap him? And do you know the thing that they were able to identify that he did consistently and faithfully? This is what it was. He had a prayer life. He had a prayer life, a prayer life that was faithful. He could be depended on. He did it all the time. And they said, we can trap him in his prayer life. Now, let me give you some characteristics about his prayer life. Let me help you to understand something about his prayer life. First of all, they're found in verse number 10. This is his prayer life. Now, when Daniel knew that the documents were signed, he entered the house. Now, in his roof chamber, he had windows open toward Jerusalem, and he continued kneeling on his knees three times a day, praying and giving thanks before his God as he had been doing previously. First thing about his prayer life, he was committed to pray. You need to write that down. He was committed to pray. Let me tell you about his commitment. He prayed three times a day. Three times a day. Not only did he pray three times a day, he he went and got on his knees three times a day and prayed. It wasn't something he did just because they signed that edict. It says he had done that previously. See, those men had watched him, and how can we trap him? Well, look at him. Every day he goes up there, and three times a day he prays. Three times a day, he gets on his knees and he prays towards Jerusalem. He is committed to pray. Now, if we want to have the power and the life of Daniel, here's one good way to start. Let's just be committed to pray three times a day. How many of us pray three times a day? Now, let me tell you about, let me tell you about we, us Christians and Baptists sometimes, not just Baptists, but just Christians as a whole. The way we pray three times a day is because we eat three times a day. Do you know that? I hope you pray before you eat. Wherever you are, I hope you pray before you eat. Somebody said, even a hog grunts before he eats, right? But Christians ought to pray before they eat. But here's what we do. Now, hold on a second. Here's what we do. We think the biblical way to eat is you eat three times a day. This is going to be worth you coming. Listen. We think the biblical way to eat is three times a day. Do you know why we think it's biblical to eat three times a day? Because Daniel prayed three times a day. And if you're going to pray, you might as well eat. Amen? (laughs) Now, you think I'm joking. I'm not joking to you. Do you know what the biblical way to eat is? Two times a day. Two times a day. I almost want to not tell you and make you find it. But I will tell you. Whenever God fed, when he fed his prophet by the raven at the brook Cherith, how many times did the raven come a day? Two times. When God fed, God fed him two times. But we decided if you're going to pray three times, you might as well supposed to eat three times. No, you're not. Not necessarily. It'd be far more. Jake says he prays without ceasing. So I guess that means he eats continuously. No comment. No comment. You want to be committed, you pray three times a day and have such a consistency in your life that somebody would say, I can tell you where they are right now. They're going to be praying three times a day. Let me tell you something. Sometimes the Muslims make us look shameful because they get out their little cloth and they pray to know God. We don't spend time to pray to our God. Amen. Three times a day, he was so committed that he prayed. Not only that, he believed in the promises of God's word. You want power in prayer? You claim the promises of God's word. I hope you noticed it says that it said he had a window open towards Jerusalem. You know why the window was open towards Jerusalem? Because he prayed towards Jerusalem. 
From Babylon he prayed towards Jerusalem. Why? Based on the promises of God's Word. Based on the promise of God. I'm going to read it for you. It's found in 1 Kings chapter 8. You can write the verses down. Verse 29, it says this. Well, verse 28. Yet have regard to the prayers of thy servant and to his supplication, O Lord my God, to listen to the cry and to the prayer which thy servant prays before thee today, that thine eyes may be open towards this house night and day, towards the place of which thou hast said, My name shall be there, to listen to the prayer which thy servant shall pray towards this place. And listen to the supplication of thy servant and thy people Israel when they pray towards this place. And hear thou in heaven thy dwelling place. Hear and forgive. Listen to verse 33. When thy people Israel are defeated before an enemy because they've sinned against thee, if they turn to thee again and confess thy name and pray and make supplication to thee in this house... Then hear thou in heaven and forgive the sin of thy people and bring them back to the land which thou didst give to their father. Listen to verse 48, same chapter. If they return to thee with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies who have taken them captive and pray to thee toward their land which thou hast given to their fathers, the city which thou hast chosen, and the house which I have built for thy name. Then hear their prayer and their supplication in heaven, thy dwelling place, and maintain their cause. Do you know why he prayed towards Jerusalem? You know why he prayed with an open window towards Jerusalem? Because that was the promise that God made to Solomon when he dedicated that temple. And he made that commitment that if my people are in exile, I will hear when they pray towards this place from the land where they are living. And Daniel prayed believing the promises of God that God would restore and reestablish his people. And you know what? In 70 years he did. He did. So you not only are committed to prayer, but you pray the promises of God. Not only that, the posture of prayer. Notice what it says. He continued kneeling on his knees. How long has it been since you got on your knees to pray? I think sometimes it would be helpful for us just to get on our knees. That's a humble position. Did you know that? It's a submissive position. Somebody says, well, I tell you what, Brother Mac, you just don't know how old I am. Well, he was 90. Well, he didn't have arthritis like I did. Well, he was 90. You might find out God might let your knees work a little better if we were bending them. Now, don't come up preaching to me afterwards. I, oh, well, Brother Mac, I'm telling you, you know what my orthopedic surgeon said? I, I don't know. I'm just saying, how long has it been since you knelt to pray? Some of us who've got good knees don't spend enough time kneeling, do we? And he got on his knees three times a day and he prayed. Not only that, look at the attitude of his prayer. And three times a day he prayed, praying and giving thanks before his God. What was his attitude of prayer? Thanksgiving. This guy had every reason in the world not to have thanksgiving. He's, he's living in a, in a foreign land. He's lived his whole life there. His nation hasn't been established, reestablished, set. He had all kinds of gripes and grumbles. People trying to trick him, trying to entrap him, trap his friends, saying all kinds of things about him. You know how he prayed? He prayed with the heart of thanksgiving. So listen to me. If we want to walk in the power of God, first of all, we've got the Spirit of God in our heart. But here's another thing. In our prayer life, we need to be committed to pray. Not only do we need to be committed to pray, we need to pray the promises of God. We need to check our posture in prayer. Sometimes it helps to kneel. And the other thing is to have a prayerful and thanksgiving in our prayer to be thanking God for what He does for us and has done for us rather than always just making supplications of what we need. That was that man's prayer. And they knew that was the place they entrapped him. So what they do? They go up to King Darius. They said, Darius, this is what we think needs to happen. They think for just one month, 30 days, we think it'd be good for your servants and your ser all those who are in the kingdom to show you their loyalty and their faithfulness to you. And, and this is what we need to do. You just need to put up a statue and an injunction whereby everybody for that 30 days, they're not to pray to any other God or to any other man. They're to pray only to you. For just 30 days, check and test the loyalty of your people. Terrible mistake. 
unwise decision and an outright lie. You know what the outright lie was? I had you to circle that in verse 7. All the commissioners and all the leaders have agreed to this. Is that true? I'll guarantee you there was one commissioner who didn't agree to that. But they outright lied to Darius saying everybody's in favor of this, but Daniel would have never been in favor of that. They lied, they deceived the king, building on his pride to say, hey, they need to all just pray to you for one month. And you know what they did beyond that? They said, oh yes, king, and here's something else. In order to make sure that this is not revoked and this is not changed, you ought to, do, you ought to make this the law of the Medes and Persians. The laws of Medes and Persians mean that cannot be changed, cannot be revoked. Now why was that? Because when it said the laws of Medes and Persians, the Medes and Persians thought that their king was God. He was a God. And a God never makes a mistake. You get that? A God never makes a mistake. If he's a God, then whatever his edict was, whatever his command was, that was a statement of God. And for him to revoke that would mean that God made a mistake and they wouldn't accept that. So even if it was a law of the Medes and Persians and somebody was found guilty under that law of the Medes and Persians and later were found out that the evidence meant they were not guilty, they were still killed because it could not be revoked because God would never make a mistake. So they said, hey, it's not enough just to put on this edict. You need to make it the law of the Medes and Persians. It cannot be changed. And with no wisdom in his heart, he says, I'll do it. And he signs it. What find next? Daniel goes and prays. He's not going to stop doing what he, he does. He's not going to stop praying to his God because of them. It's just like his, his three Hebrew friends. What did I tell you? Anytime that it comes to a place that, that civil government tells us we can or cannot do that is something in opposition and opposing the will of our God, we are responsible to do what our God tells us to do, whatever the cause might be and whatever the case might be and whatever the punishment might be. We're to do what God says to do because his law is higher. And whenever they said, you can't pray, he wasn't going to stop Daniel pray. He wasn't going to go hide and pray. He opened up the windows. He wanted anybody to see where he was. He was going to do exactly what he did. And whatever the punishment might be, the punishment would have to come. Well, as soon as he prays, what do those people do? They go and they see the king. And I just see that. I don't know. In my mind, I just see him sneering, kind of laughing about that. And they're kind of laughing at it. They come to the king and say, hey, king, let me ask you a question. Didn't you make an injunction? Can't you hear him? Didn't you make an injunction? Didn't you write a law? You remember that what that law said? Wasn't that law that nobody could, could kneel and make petitions or any, to any other gods or man for 30 days? And also, King, do you remember that? Wasn't that the law of the Medes and Persians? It couldn't be changed. Yes, it was the law. Yes, that's right. Exactly. I wrote that law. Well, someone has broken that law. Someone has no respect for you. Someone has been disobedient to you. And who is that? That's that exile from Judah. His name is Daniel. You remember Daniel, don't you? He has made petition to his God. And when the king heard that, it says he came under distress. Why? Because he knew. He knew he had been deceived. He knew why those people had said to make that law. He knew all of that had been set to be a trap and he had fallen into that trap and he loved Daniel and he knew that Daniel was vital to him. He was going to elevate Daniel to be over the whole kingdom and now they're coming to say this and yes, king, Daniel is the one who broke the law and he deserves, based on your word, he deserves to be thrown in the lion's den. King under distress, you know what it says? He tried even till sunset to try to find a way to get out of it. He didn't want Daniel to die. He was sick in his spirit that he had been so deceived. But what happens? Verse 15. Then these men came by agreement to the king and said, Recognize, O king, that it's the law of the Medes and Persians that no injunction or statute which the king establishes may be changed. And there was nothing the king could do. Nothing that he could change. He was going to have to take Daniel, his faithful servant, the wisest of the wise, the most distinguished of all, and he's going to have to place him and put him into a lion's den. It does. Then the king gave orders, and Daniel was brought in and cast into the lion's den. But I love these words, and it puts us to where we'll be next week. The king spoke, said to Daniel, 
your God, whom you, what? Constantly serve. May? No, not may. Will himself deliver you. That's a pagan king. Your God, whom you constantly serve, will himself deliver you. And it sets the stage for the miraculous. It sets the stage for God to move in again and to reveal his glory and to reveal his power. He will do the same for us when we're people of an ordinary, extraordinary spirit who have a prayer life and committed to the Lord Jesus and desire to walk with him in integrity of heart and faithful in our life. God wants to do the same in our life. Now, if Daniel doesn't challenge you to be a better Christian, if Daniel doesn't challenge you to be a better person, if Daniel doesn't speak to your heart because of the example he is, I don't know who will other than Jesus himself. Because Daniel is an unusual person with an extraordinary spirit and a marvelous faith. May God help us to be that way. May God challenge us. And may we follow his example of his prayer life. If just one thing, just follow the example of his prayer life. Be committed to pray. Pray the promises of God in the right posture. If not kneeling, at least the posture of your heart with a thankful spirit. And the power of God shows up. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you.